Hey everybody, what's going on? Shabby Do here, and today what I've got for you are some shabby tips for Founders Fortune. We've got 10 big tips to have a successful start and bring you straight to the finish. This will make the game very smooth for you to get going and a lot less stress and no re-rolling. So the very first thing you're gonna wanna do is when you start your game, you're gonna wanna make sure you have two great colonists to help you out with. Now, these are tips for beginners, obviously. If you're advanced, I go with random. It makes it more fun. But otherwise, you know, when you start your game, you're gonna go in, you're gonna see you have personalities and you have skills for each one. You can hit random. Couple skills you want. Here's one of them, tireless. All right, it makes it so they don't sleep as much and they recover sleep in half the time. So tireless is a great skill, as well as optimist. It always gives them a positive mood boost, which we'll go into later. Things to avoid for personality are things that are, one's called dumb. You do not want dumb. It makes it so they can never learn any more skills. Their levels never rise. So they are what they are. They're going to be a big old dumb dumb for the rest of the game. And you want to avoid pessimist as well. Other ones, this will give them a negative mood permanently. And then other ones to avoid, but not necessary to re-roll a character on, are any sort of food allergies. Uh, you're going to start your game, we'll go into it more, with potatoes and tomatoes. Having a food allergy to one of those is pretty hard to get around, but we can get rid of those traits. So if you have a good farmer with skills, but they have an allergy, don't worry about it. Very easy. Just avoid pessimist and dumb, okay? and try and get tireless and or optimist if you can. One or the other is a great thing. Now, skills. You're going to start off with two villagers. You're going to want one that has a doctor skill. Would be great. Not master outfit like we see here. You're going to want something maybe like splinting. Other than that, we're going to want... And this is up to you. Uh, a miner is usually pretty good. Or instead of the miner get a farmer who can get cooking at campfire right here because that'll unlock our next tier of food which makes us heal or it fills our satiation a lot quicker than raw food would so it's very important so go with doctor and a farmer with cooking or a miner because we're going to get a third colonist very quickly once we get into expectations so whichever one of the three you don't get in the beginning get for the third one or get them there quick Okay, my opinion, go for a doctor and a farmer with cooking at campfire. Miner can wait. So the next one, we're going to hit start game here because this is also the very next thing we're going to do is, and it's a little overwhelming when you get in, it's where do we start our base? So important things. People think they want to be near a lot of trees and stone. Not that important. What you want to be away from our goblin villages, one this size is okay because we can take them out pretty quickly. But you want to avoid some big ones because if they become your enemy, they're gonna be they're gonna hurt once they start sending them over because they will attack unless you turn that off in the options. Now, what you will want to be near are apple trees. Right here would be an awesome spot. Even though it's near a village, we would just want to make sure we stay friendlies with these boys here. Right now, if you click on the huts. We can see these guys are at negative 30. They will attack on site. So we'd have to mend that relationship. Not advisable to go near anyone that has an attack on site in the beginning of a game. It'll hurt. But this is a very good spot. You want to be near apples because they're great throughout the whole game. And they're always giving you food in the summer. Amazing starter spot. Crystals are nearby. You have trees. You don't need to be near a lot of trees. Just some. Your farmers will replant trees as they, or sorry, your lumberjacks will replant trees as they go, which is great. And you've got crystal and we've got stone and iron's a plus as well. But the main thing you want, you want apple trees and you want to try and be away from villages that are aggressive like these guys right here. All right. And for tip number three, it's going to be about research. So you're going to follow the little tutorial. It's going to tell you to build a scholar stand, which looks like this right here. And that'll allow us to do research when we mine crystals. These right here. And if we go up to our little 
our or hourglass, our little science beaker here and click on it, you'll see this is the research menu. Now, obviously, this is one of my save files. It's a little further, but you'll start down here and you'll have three options, woodworking, farming, and this one writing down here. Now, I'm going to say go for farming first, easy five crystals, followed by another quick woodworking. Focus on these two and then have your farms get set down. Having farms early will help you because you need food to survive. And when you get to winter, you can't grow any food. So the only food you might be able to get is some wildlife out there that you can kill. So be prepared for winter. Start farming immediately. Get these five crystals. Get, get them researched immediately and throw down some tomatoes for the spring and summer. And potatoes for the summer and fall. Have a good surplus of them. You can see here, this is my potato side. These are my tomatoes here. These are good sizes and maybe even in the beginning, make them a little bigger. And if you have two people focusing on them, you'll manage them perfectly, okay? Now, going back in here to the research, woodworking is another great one to get next because it's cheap for one. And two, we can use wood to make tools, which we can then potentially sell to the trader. So another big thing in the game is money because we can buy things from the trader and sell to him. Wooden tools are great for that built and also for upgrading our people. When your people are doing their tasks, they're going to kick trees and kick rocks and they're going to break their arms and feet eventually. So getting woodworking and making wooden axes and wooden pickaxes allows them to work without breaking their limbs or at least substantially lowers the chance of it. And it'll also let you build some surplus with your extra wood so you can sell to the traders. Now, another big research key is writing. Some people say go for this first. I don't. This is a great third one. It's called writing. You want to get this and then get the large bookshelf. And what that is, is this right here. And when you send your people to it, you can have them learn a skill. So learn about farming, foresting, mining, crafting, medicine, and researching. Only thing they can't learn about is combat which you need a training dummy for. Now, what's so great about this is because when you get into your skill trees here, you need to progress their skill levels, like Annie here is a level 15 forester, so that you can unlock the different skill paths to, the, to their different associated abilities. So for instance, for farmers, um, let me look at an actual farmer here. Here's one. So for farmers, you're going to have, you know, sowing strawberries and wheat, which are like, and mid to high level tier kind of stuff, but cooking at campfires a point, cooking at a kitchen, another upgrade, which is a point, and bakery, and also your master outfits. So that's why the bookcase is important, because when you get to things like a doctor, you can't level that up without a bookcase in the beginning, because you have no way to actually be a doctor to gain points. So you do that, and you know, for any of these besides soldiers. So that way you can level up and get different skills within each tree. So very important, but it's definitely the third one. You want the other twos first, just so you can get yourself started and rolling, okay? Now, what's going to be next is you're going to notice that our little colonists have expectations. So tip number four here is going to be about managing expectations. When you have two of them, you can see here that this is the expectations. They're all green. It means they're all met right now. So because they're all met, if I click on our bonfire, you'll see that my colonists' expectations are met and the next chance for migrants is in 12 minutes. So when they're all met, you have a chance to get a migrant in that time and then you can accept them into the colony. So when you first start off, it's going to tell you to build a bed and just assign it to them, yada, yada. So follow those. And when you go in, you know, you can highlight it. So like this one here, so actually, this is one of my older people. So they're the most needy. So they want kitchen food or baked goods. So not a campfire. It needs to be the next tier higher to satisfy them. They want to live in an amazing home, own a bedroom, own a proper bed, sleep inside. Um, they want to have satisfactions. They want to have friends. They want to have uh, certain profession proficiencies, etc. So make sure you maintain those. And don't feel like it's a necessity. If you're not looking to get new colonists, then don't do them right away. You know, work towards them. You know, it affects their moods as well, but it's not a game ending thing. It doesn't make them too negative if you don't have them. So again, if you don't have it, don't worry about it, but just make sure it's on your radar because you can't progress and get more colonists without expectations being met. 
Now, a secondary thought with expectations is as you gain more colonists, their expectations rise and they have higher expectations. So right now, if I got another colonist, instead of Stacy just wanting to own a bedroom, she would actually want to live in her own house here. Now, I just had an elder die and she lived in this house because her expectation was to have her own house. Okay, so one of the biggest things is providing living quarters for your people. What I suggest is building something like this. Now, this is just overly large. I wasn't sure what I was expecting for people, but I built this and I built seven rooms down here, which was a perfect number, by the way. Seven rooms on the base floor. And these are, what are these? They're three by four rooms, okay? So with a three by four room, building seven of them, you can accommodate all their needs for their bedrooms here. And the biggest key, they won't be jealous of each other because we're going to give them the same exact things in the bedroom. If one bedroom has higher beauty than the other, the colonists will get jealous. So we can see here, bedroom beauty is 10, house beauty is 257. So if this room here was at, well, this one is because actually I don't have, the height here is just very not needy, but like you want to keep them the same, like 16, 16, 16, 16. They're not going to get jealous of each other that way. So that's why if we build these little rooms here, you can accommodate all of your colonists at once in one room because in one house, because they all have different other secondary expectations for living. If we come down here, important possessions. So actually, I don't know why Annie still wants it, but I had raised Annie from a baby, but apparently she wants a bookshelf in her room still for children. Guess she's still a child at heart. But you can see here what they all want. Now, looking at someone like Dedra Nelson, they want a chest in their room. Zahite the here, he wants a big shelf or wardrobe in the house, as well as a couch and a fireplace. And I think that's it for within the house, right? Yes. So all of that, oh, and a table and a chair in his house. Now, if you build a house for every single one of your colonists, you're going to have to make sure you're building all that extra stuff as well to keep them happy. But if you start off like this, good seven rooms, building everything in here, they're all going to not, none of them will be jealous. They'll have all their expectations met and everything's already there and they're going to be very happy. And then as you gain people, I think it's at like your seventh or eighth colonist is when some of your older ones will start to want their own house. They all won't want it, but it depends on the age of the colonist, their longevity within the colony. So for instance, when I got there, I only needed a couple of these houses. I'm building extra with my wood as I get it, but you only need to upgrade a few. So this will still be used all throughout your playtime. So highly suggest building a one functional house with about seven rooms, three by four. And what you're going to put in it, because it'll be the same for every single person over time, you don't need to do it immediately, is a flower pot, a vase, and a chest, a simple wooden chest. These are three needs that they all require in the room. Eventually, not immediately, but they'll all require that eventually. So if you make this, it'll give them enough space to walk in, go to their beds. And I also have a tool storage here so they can hold their tools. So and I keep that all right nearby and it keeps them all very happy. So very important when you make your rooms, start like this. It's very cheap, very easy. You don't have to build tens of different things. You don't have to have five different tables in your colony. It wastes all your resources. And trust me, you're going to want your resources when you're starting out. So that's your nice tip number five. And I would say one of your most important tips, build one big colony apartment complex. All right, tip number six. And this is also very important because it relies with the food here of your colony. Farming is crucial, okay? As we talked about with research, get your farming research done as soon as possible. And then make sure you're micromanaging your farmers to make sure that they're actually planting Another thing you're going to want to get with research, but I would say after the bookcase, is you're going to want to work down your farming path here. Don't worry about these right away. Unless you plan to just be a mass murderer, then get your wooden swords. Otherwise, get through tailoring and gardening, okay? And then here, we want watering. This will obtain us the wooden well and a tool called a watering can. 
what this unlocks for us here is the well here. Okay, and that'll allow us to gather water from it to water our crops, which will increase our yield. So we have to make a wooden watering can from the carpenter's workshop for 50 wood. So you get this, equip them to your farmers by clicking on their tool chest. So we can see here what Shabby do. He has, he has a tool chest here and I have the wooden watering can selected. Don't worry about all these pop-ups. It's, it's just because I've been leaving the game up doing nothing, so they're all getting mad because I'm not helping them. <laughs> but yeah, so get your watering can and then even tell them, make sure they're out there actually watering the plants because it'll you can water them twice and it can increase the yield up to three to four times. So instead of getting one potato, you'll get three of them, okay? Very, very important. And that'll make your lives so much easier with food, especially going into winter. And a good number to be sat on for food for the winter is about 100 raw food, okay? You want to have, between your raw food and your cooked food, you want to have about 100 to 125, and you'll be all set to make it all the way through winter with your three or four colonists. Now, tip number seven ties in very heavily with the farming there's going to be something called a bug infestation that happens. I never, I don't think I saw it during my first year. It hits me every year and it definitely hit me in spring of year two. Okay. So what's going to happen is you'll get a pop up on your screen. And it'll say bug infestation. Okay. Now what you're going to want to do, give it a quick pause, head over to your farm. So like whether I was over here, if I see bug infestation, pause the game, hit space, and then go to your farm and go, okay, unpause, give it a second or two. And then you'll start to see little bugs popping out of all your crops. Give it a pause. Now, one big downfall, in my opinion, of this game is your farmers do not automatically go to try and stop a bug infestation. And when a bug infestation spreads, it kills crops. So you want to nip it in the butt real quick. So what I do, I grab every single one of my people and I send them over to, to do the bug infestation. So I'll grab Stacy here. I would right click. It would say remove all bug in or remove all infested plants. I would click it, go to the height, pick a different one and do that for every single one. And then I would start time back up and then they would all go and start to remove the infestation. Very important to hit it quick. And it's also why I have paths open down the middles here because and separated because they'll bounce from crop to crop. So if you let it go too quick, it can it can kill your entire farm. And if you haven't watched my Founder's Fortune series, it's a couple episodes in, but in spring year two, oh boy, you'll see what happens when an infestation spreads quickly, okay? So make sure you nip that in the butt as soon as it comes up. Do not dilly-dally because your own colonists will not take care of it. You have to do it for them. Now, tip number eight little important not so much though it just helps for speed so as you go in and progress you know if you unlock the brewing station and you place it down you'll start having pirates visit you now you can stay in good relations with them if you accept they'll ask for tributes for you they'll make demands and as long as you accept them they'll stay friendly and they won't attack you as long as you pay them a, a basically. It's the same with the goblins on the island. So you can kill them and wipe them out by sending your warriors over, killing the goblins, and then destroying their tiki huts, and then they won't respond. Or you can be friends with them, you know, and you can contact them. You can demand tributes from them when your relationship rises, and they'll also ask things of you. As long as they're not too demanding, I would take them, okay? Now... Why I say this is because if you get a negative relationship with people, like you saw with me with the pirates here, um, they're going to randomly send raids after me. And it's the same with the goblins. So as they send raids after you, you're going to want to be hitting this combat mode. And then your farm, all of your colonists are going to stop what they're doing. And they're going to run to their nearest thing. So here I have a hut with their armor rack and their weapon rack. They're going to all come over here grab their gear, get geared up for war, and then wait for my command to attack. So then I would highlight them all and then attack them. Now, the reason why I say it's important, but it's not, it's just very helpful for you. If you have a base set up with a war room in a very easily accessed area where, tar where attacks might come from, I've got a big village here. 
I'm in a friendly relationship with them, but if they attack, they're going to come this way and come through towards this gate. So I put my war room right in the middle here. So no matter where my people work, they all come up here, they get geared up, and now they're near where most things are going to happen. You know, pirates will come from all around the coast. My layout here is not great for pirate invasions. I would suggest more inland, but they'll all come here and get geared up and get ready to go. And it's nice and quick that way. And then that way you're not losing all your stuff. Now, this does tie in with war, but it happens over time too. You are going to want a doctor in your colony from learning from this workshop or from the bookshelf here. Now, why it's so important is because you'll notice when you start the game, I think you get five illness medicine and you're not going to be able to make those for a while. You need to get a lot of research in. You have to get basic medicine to be able to get a medicine cabinet and get soil for plants. So you see here that this requires scrolls. You can only buy those from traders. They're like 150, 175 gold a piece. The price fluctuates, but that's the only way to get them. And it's not quick to get, okay? So save those because eventually your colonists will get the flu. Now, what's going to happen is if they have the flu and you don't cure it, they're going to die. You need an illness medicine and... Your doctor can fail to administer that illness medicine, okay? So you need multiple around. They'll be stored in this medicine cabinet here, okay? So make sure you have a doctor ready. Even if it's just someone with the doctor, you just have them trained for a little bit. And then you go in and you just make sure to give them flu treatment. And I would even suggest better flu treatment. I don't have it on him for some reason because he's newer. But get the better flu treatment so they have a higher chance of succeeding. This path right here, very important. Applying splints. Also important because your workers can break their limbs while working. If you, And it, if it's just a sprain, they'll keep working. They'll work slower. But if they break an arm, they will not work until it's fixed. And it takes like an hour. So you have to apply a splint to get that taken care of. Or if they break a leg, they might not be able to even move. So they could be stuck in bed that entire time. And you have to send your people over to feed them. So make sure you have a doctor and train them well, okay? Now, speaking of training well, tip 8 point, what are we? We're on 9. Tip 9.5, right? Master outfits and common outfits. You can always put an apprentice outfit on someone. The skill is for master outfits only from a tailor shop. So you can see apprentice doctor robes here. Requires 40 cloth. Offers minor protection. And they have a, they give you better chances with your skills they increase your skill proficiency so having them equipped on all of your people for their proper proficiencies is critical it's very helpful okay so make sure you put clothes on everyone it, it sounds dumb but get your apprentice clothes on get everyone and then as they unlock master build some master clothes for them as well very very useful and all right, guys, this leads us to the final tip. And honestly, this is the most important tip here. So if you made it here, leave a comment down below. Just tell me you made it to tip 10 and you're going to follow tip 10, okay? Because if you don't follow this tip, you're not going to make it through this game. And really, it's very simple too. Take your time and enjoy the game, okay? Now, you can rush through this as fast as possible. You can get migrants as fast as you want. But every time you get a new migrant, you're... A couple colonists are going to want more and more within their expectations, which can get harder to handle if you don't have the skills necessary to do it. More people are more mouths to feed. If you don't have enough farmers or space to take care of that, or people to cook the food, people to go out and collect the wood, collect the stone, collect the crystals to keep your research going, etc., you're going to slowly choke yourself to death and cause what could potentially be a wipe. Okay? So take your time, make sure you have everything you need to keep progressing. So like, you know, I know that what I know what's coming next because I've had pe more people. They've just died. I just got into an incredibly big war. So I lost a person. I also had just one die of old age. So but I know that as soon as I hit like seven people, I think, or eight, they're going to want houses. And I figured that out just because I accepted a migrant and then three of my people were like, we want our own house now. It's like, well, all right, I got to start building extra houses, which means I got to build them remotely similar. So they're not jealous of each other. So I've got shabby condominiums coming in at shabby point and they look like this, you know, this is it. It's just a nice little 
three by six with a three by three entrance with another three by six room up top for bedroom bottom floor for any couches and whatnot that we're going to put in eventually so yeah that's tip 10 guys have fun and really take your time okay it the game gets harder as you get more proficient in it okay that's all it is so go slow and go low but all right, guys, this was your 10 beginner tips. I made this because I realized there weren't really many out there. And from a lot of comments from my from my ongoing series right now with Founders Fortune with the release of the game, I, I felt like, oh, wow, you know, people keep talking about like some of these basic beginner things. And I was like, what's out there for beginner tips? There wasn't. There was one from a year ago. So I wanted to give this guys to you. So if you did like this, let, leave me a comment down below. Tell me that don't forget to hit like as well. So you can see our founders fortune series and hit subscribe and hit that bell because you'll see that series coming out every single day, 9, 15 Eastern standard time, as well as our regular videos. Cause we post every day because we're crazy, but all right, guys, as usual, this has been shabby do. This has been your 10 tips for founders fortune. I hope the rest of your day is not too shabby.